Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, good evening. First of all, a little bit about myself. My name is Rui Romano. I'm from Portugal. I work on the Power BI CAD team uh, at Microsoft, where we stand in the middle between large customers, the, pro the product group. We try to learn from them, curate their, their feedback, take that feedback back to the product group, and then ultima ultimately scale it. And that's what I'm doing here. So I'm sharing a lot, uh, some learnings that I that I use uh, on my work and sharing with, with all of you. I'm, uh, I live in Portugal. I re I'm a really, really passionate about data and Power BI in particular. And uh, these are my contacts. Everything that I'm about to show you, it's already on my GitHub. So you can go there, the slides, the demo, so you don't need to, <laughs> to, um, to worry about saving anything. You can go GitHub, Rui Romano, session slides. With the slides, there will be links. So Everything that I'm about to show you you, 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 you can get it from there. Don't forget the feedback. So this is really important. In the end, I will show the, the, the QR code again. But please give the feedback. This is good for the organization. You will contribute to a better world, world because every feedback generates a tree. So it's good. Uh, and you can win prizes. So the session today is called Power BI Development on Steroids. So the idea of the session is basically to show you some very, very basic stuff, some very advanced stuff, uh, but mostly is to enhance your development techniques. It's to make you more productive. I'm really passionate about this, making people more productive. Um, some of the things will be fast-paced. Maybe every single thing that I'm about to show you, you there could be, it could be a full session, a full hour session about it. So, don't stress, if you, are, if you are new to Power BI, you will probably be a little bit confused, but be more focused on understanding the techniques, why this is important, uh, and of course, if you have any questions, please, please ask. So let's start really simple. So these two tools, there are many tools in Power BI, but these two, if you don't use it, so DAX Studio and Tableau Editor, Believe me, you are not being productive, okay? It's, it's, they, are, they, are, it, they, not, they don't only allow you to do things that you cannot do with the out-of-the-box tools, but they really, really allow you to be more productive. So if you don't use them, by the way, anyone here that doesn't use any of these tools? Great. So what I will do, and that's why this could, could be a full session on the topic, is I will give you my personal take on them. So the first one, DAX Studio, is basically a DAX editor. So you can open it, you can write queries. That is something that is not many people know about. It's a DAX builder. So it, 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 it has a, a DAX builder that you can build your queries by drag and drop. And this is insanely useful. For example, for a, a, an end user that uses Excel, it can build a DAX query and then push that, that DAX query to an Excel file and it will be connected. Instead of building that cube values and cube sets and expensive queries that will stress out your premium capacity or your, your, the Power BI data set. The quick inspect model, so you can inspect the model and see and understand clearly, for example, which are the columns and the tables that contribute the most to the size of your one gigabyte data set. And maybe there is a column there and you should ask that question, do I really need that, this column? And believe me, this happens a lot. Uh, no, we don't, we might need that later, wrong. <laughs> that, 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 whenever someone tells me we might need that later, it's, it's like a scream. Remove the column. If you need that later, you spend the 10 minutes later adding the column. Don't add it there just because you might need that later. And then I will do a demo uh, on DAX tuning, tuning and debugging. I, I'm not a DAX expert by any means, but, um, but that is something that I see a lot, a lot of times. Even in large customers, even with good partners is getting the, that, okay, this report is slow, this matrix with 10 measures is slow, and then spending a day figuring it out which measure is the slowest one. And you have a tool that can really tell you, is this one? And then you pick that measure and you fix it. And you know that's the measure that is, that is causing the slow performance. So let me do a quick demo, I don't, about DAX Studio. I don't know what's happening with my mouse, but it's not working, okay. So when you install DAX Studio, you will see that it will show up in here in the external tools. DAX Studio will show up in here. So you can just open DAX Studio, and it will open the instance of DAX Studio connected to your model. Uh, and it, with just a blank page where you can type your queries. 
but I will show you the query builder. So in here, that is this query builder option, you can click it, and then you can, for example, drag, okay, I wanna see barcodes by color and by city, and I wanna see the measure sales or number of invoices. And I can also, I want to also filter by year, 2016. So as an end user, this is useful because I don't know how to write DAX or I could not know how to write DAX. I can even see the DAX it's generating for me. So if I click here on edit query, I will be able to see the DAX, which is good. Now, what I really like about this is I, you can run it and you can, for, you can see the results, of course, and you can export this file. So, and you can export in two ways, linked and static. But if you export it, select the option linked, this is very cool because you run it and this will give you an Excel file with an hidden gem in Excel that no many people know about. It's a table, but it's a connected table. It's a linked table. And in here, you have the DAX statement of that, that, that was generated in, a, in, a, in DAX Studio. And because it's connected, when the data changes, you can just refresh this table. And this is way, way more efficient if, you, if your end user, first, if the end user, the, the first question that you should ask end user if he really needs this, but if, you're, if he really needs a listing, this will be way more efficient than creating the listing using the pivot table that behind the scenes will, it will generate a DAX sta uh, an MDX statement. So this can be uh, a, a nice option for those that require any kind of listings. Now, other thing very, very useful on DAX Studio is the, the view metrics. So if you go on advanced, you have the, this option view metrics, you can click it, and this will just show you, for example, what I do whenever I'm working with a customer that has a one gigabyte file, is, is uh, complaining about performance or complaining about the size, whatever, is I just go here, I select the columns options, and I, I just start asking a very simple question. Do you, really, do you need this column? Do you need this column? Uh, that, this is a surrogate key in the, in, the, in the fact table. Probably we don't need this column. Remove it. And we, you, you just saved 15% of, uh, of, of the size of your, of your data set. So view metrics is another thing. The other one, and maybe the most the more advanced one, but it's, it's uh, the, 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 um, what I use the most whenever I'm doing any kind of of DAX uh, tuning is I have this report and over here I have a table that is slow. It's not very, very slow because I don't want to spend too much time. And the thing is, why is it slow? I could, of course, select the, the, select the visual, see the measures, see the DAX code in Power BI Desktop and spend hours maybe doing that or I could go directly to the point why this is slow. The first thing, you go to view, and you have this option in Power BI Performance Analyzer, you click here, you start the recording, and then refresh the visuals, and this will show you for each visual the amount of time it will take. So the first thing that you see here is, this is the visual that is taking most time. So this is where I should focus. You can click, and you have this option, Copy Query. You click on Copy Query, you go back to DAX Studio, and you paste the query. And now, and I'm not going to focus about the DAX. I just want to, f to show you the technique that is so simple, but sometimes is, a lot of times is forgotten. So in here, this is the DAX that is generated by Power BI, but you have here a variable, this DS core. So the, the main query is in here. And you can see that there are some, uh, I think, six measures. Uh, it, th this part over here is because of calculation groups. So let's just ignore it. Uh, I have six measures. Which measure is the slowest one? So what you need to do is you go to home and you need to enable this feature, server timings. Let's enable it. And you should also, on this run, you have this button, it, it should enable the option clear cache then run. Because Power BI data sets and analysis services has a cache, so you need to clear, every time you run, it should clear the cache to, to, to have a, uh, a good baseline. And now, my mouse broke, out, broke again, you can run it. Oh, no, it's not. Now it's still connected to Excel. This is not what I want. Sorry. 
Let's change the output back to grid. And I would like my mouse to work, but it's not working. Cancel, run. And, and now it ran, it gave you the results, and in here you have the server timings because we enable server timings. And on the server timings, what I can see is that, yes, the query took four seconds, 66 storage engine queries. I don't go, well, I'm not going to enter in details why, uh, why it's this. I, I, I just want to pin down, I just want to know which measure is, is the slowest. And this is really simple. It's not rocket science. What you should do, or what I do, is I have six, let's comment the first, and let's run it again. And it will take the four seconds. So I know that these are not the problem, but I'm, I'm a little bit suspicious that I like to really confirm lots of, it could be a false positive. Let's try it again. And okay, there is a comment here. Let's run it again. Server timings, 76 milliseconds. So it's correct. So this is, this is not my problem. It should be a problem in one of these two. And I do this, the same thing. So the, the problem will be on this one. Let's move it forward. Let's run it. Let's make sure that this is the measure that is causing the My Performance issue. It is. And now, another thing on DAX Studio, important for you to understand, is you can change the measure here. You, you don't need to go back to Power BI Desktop that in a big model to be slow to work. In, you can change the measure here, you can, you can optimize it, and you can run it again, again, and, and, and compare it with the, with the previous baseline, and be sure that your optimization really made an effect. So and to do that, you search for the measure. So this is sales amount versus last year. Sales amount versus last year, it should be, uh, should be here. And you have this option, define measure. And when you click on this define measure, this will define the measure inside the DAX uh, editor. And the change that you make here will have effect in the query that you are running. So I already made that optimization, so I can look here. It's not using variables. This should be a better version. So I think I fixed the issue. Let's run it again. And no, I didn't fix the issue yet. Because there is a dependency on another measure. So Maybe my pro I know, I already know that, okay, it's not on this measure, the issue. The issue should be on this measure. And I go and search for that measure. By the way, you also have a define with dependent measures, but I'm going step by step. So let's define this measure. And I have a, a problem. I'm using the last date because I, I just want, I want to calculate the same period last year, but considering the last day of today, I, I don't want to compare the, 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 this period with the full month of the, of, the, of the previous year. So I fix the code, I run it, and now I know that this was the issue. Now it's running in 75 milliseconds, so the takeaway the take here is identify what's the actual measure that is causing your problem, fix it, and then take the code back to Power BI Desktop and test it on the report. So, and this, as you can see, it's very simple to do. It's just testing. You don't need it. It's not rocket science, but it's something that I see a lot of times uh, uh, developers not doing and spending hours trying and trying in, a, in, a, in, in the tool that it's not for, for, the, for, for the purpose. Now, Tableau Editor, okay, well-known tool, uh, commercial version, out of, uh, uh, open source version. Um, my main use cases for Tableau Editor is first, if it is a big model, if it is an enterprise model, and if you want to develop faster, you will develop insanely faster in Power BI, in Tableau Editor. Yes, it's a different environment, it's more advanced, but things like selecting all the measures, applying a display folder, selecting all the measures, moving it to another table, copy pasting, you can open two data sets at the same time, copy things from one to the other. So you can really, really be more efficient on the development. Another one that it's more, many times is missed is the deployment. So you have a 500 megabyte file, and every time you want to deploy any measure, you are uploading a 500 megabyte file through the network and waiting 15 minutes. Hey guys, 
Talk to, take those 15 minutes and go grab a coffee, go be with your kids, don't <laughs> go do whatever you want, but don't spend it waiting, looking at the screen. And you, with Tower Editor, you can open, even if you don't use Tower Editor, okay? Even if you don't know how to use Tower Editor, you can open Tower Editor and just do the deployment to your uh, workspace, and it will just deploy the model. It won't deploy the data. Because on the Power BI file, the PBIX, it's a, a mixture between the re report, the data, and the data set, the, 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 the model. So you can deploy only using this schema. And the third, if you are working, for example, in a consulting company with a team, this is what can really make your team go to steroids. Okay? It's the, the best practice analyzer. Why? Because on a team, you have, let's say, a team of five, you have one very senior developer that is really, really good, Another one that is really, really good as well. And then the other three are juniors. They are learning. So they don't know the best practices. What you can do is, in your team, you can define a collection of best practice rules that your team like to follow. Naming conventions, removing unused columns. What, you can do a lot. Everything, you can inspect your model. You can define your own rules. And then you can give that to the junior developer that is working on the team. And instead of the junior developer spending one hour with the senior developer, you will say, OK, before you go and talk with the senior developer, run this, make sure that you follow all the rules, and then come, come back uh, and, and talk to me. And I will teach you why. And look, <laughs> I see the, I see, I've seen this happen. You can go in productivity inside the team from here to here. Okay? This is insanely useful. So how do you use Tableau Editor? Same thing, you install it. After you install it, you have here the external tools. Ah, my mouse. And you just open Tableau Editor. And yes, it's a, it's a, scary, uh, a scary development environment. And, but once you get used to, it's OK. So you have all the tables. You can which is very, very cool. You can make developments here. You save the, you save the, you save the file, and, and, and the changes that you make are going to be reverted back to the, to the Power BI data set. So I won't go into much detail. So you can watch the, in the slides there is a link to that introduces the tool for you. I just want to show the deploy. So look, I'm, I'm still working on Power BI desktop, but I can open Tableau Editor and select this option, Model, Deploy, you need premium for that, premium per user or premium, uh, premium capacity. You put the URL of your premium capacity, you do the authentication, and then, okay. Now, nowadays, multi factor authentication is, is the thing. Okay, it's then. And then, this is what you need to care about. So you can deploy to a new database, you can deploy to an existing database. Let's deploy to an existing database. And in here, you can say, uh, if you want to want to de deploy the module structure, you can say, if you don't want to deploy the partitions, for example, you might have incremental refresh, or you might have your own partitioning, you can select those, those rules. You might be in a situation where you don't have your roles, the role-level security implemented in Power BI Desktop, but you want to implement it in a dynamic way online, so you can select, you have some options to select what you want to deploy, and then you just deploy. And instead of waiting 10 minutes, this will run in seconds, okay? I won't wait. Uh, okay. And last but not least, the best practice analyzer. Now the thing on best practice analyzer is this, you will find a, a, a rules that were created by, by a colleague of mine, Michael Kowalski, but you can change it. You can change it to your own very specific team rules. Okay? You can change this. But, and believe me, it's really worth the effort of one day, two day, three days working on those rules to really specify the most important development rules that, uh, that you have on your team. And each team will have its, its, uh, their own ones. I will tell you my favorite one. My favorite is this one that will show up in here. It's like uh, uh, whenever I see this, I start asking questions. It's uh, the remove unused columns. It's in here. So in the remove un unnecessary columns are columns that are hidden. They are not used in measures. 
They are not used in relationships. They are not using anywhere. Why the column is there? Just remove it. Because no one knows about the column. It's hidden. So you can remove it. And, uh, sorry? Okay, can I, can I, can I go? Okay. Um, so you can just remove it. And another thing that you can do is if you go really, really advanced, you can even do some uh, continuous integration, continuous deployment, and you can have these rules running on Azure DevOps and, and block the deployment if one of these rules are not met, which can not, can not only also make the deployments way more productive, but can also uh, uh, make, it, make sure that your developers are not doing uh, what, uh, what they should, uh, they, are, they, they are not doing what they should do. Can you, can you ask the, the, the question? Yeah, there is. Uh, in the slides, in here. Oh, sorry, sorry. The question was if there is any, uh, if there is any best practices uh, uh, published online. Um, if you go on the slides, you, there will be, there is a link to the best practice rules that was created by Michael, where he, where you can see the, all the rules that, the, that, uh, that you can download the rules and you can also see uh, and inspect all the rules that he created. Uh, but best practices on Power BI, you can find like a ton of them, okay? Not only on the, docu on the, on the documentation, but also uh, on the community. I have another one. Sometimes uh, you can't do download PBX in PBI services after the deployment. It's a form of tool. It happens with the Elanox toolkit. Can it happen with Tableau Elanox as well? So the question was if uh, the, um, sometimes the download PBIX doesn't work online. Uh, when when it deployed with the ALM toolkit, yes, that will happen even on Tableau Editor because when you deploy with Tableau Editor, the 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 deployment option gets disabled. Uh, but now, if you if you that's a choice you need to make. If you really want to make the, the keep the download PBIX of always available, or if if you wanna spend the time uploading that those big files. The main thing that uh, my recommendation is don't rely on the file that is published online. Have a backup file on DevOps or on OneDrive. The, the most important file is the file that you own on your development environment. It's not the one that is published. Because the download PBIX, and I see this happening as well, it might not work. Even if you publish with Power BI Desktop, it, there could be a problem and, or, or the file or the data set grow so much that you cannot not download. So don't rely on, on, the, on the download PBIX. So that's for me, it's not a problem, but yes, it's a limitation. When you use the XMLA endpoint, when you deploy it with the XMLA endpoint, you lose the option of the download data set uh, online. Can I move forward? Yeah. Okay. Okay, now let's talk about some uh, development techniques and tips. The first one, <laughs> and this is, in, this is insanely useful, okay, for you as a Power BI developer, and I see a lot of people that don't know about this, and this is free. You can create your own tenant, a developer, it's not a trial, it's different than a trial. It's a developer, 365 developer subs subscription that will get you 25 E5 licenses. It not, it's not 25 Power BI licenses, it's, it's, it's E5. You get Power Automate, you get Power Apps, you get all the stuff. You get emails, you get Teams, you can have your own tenant. And you can be in full tenant admin control. So you can test whatever you want. You can test that, okay, what, what will a free user see on my report? Uh, when you publish an app, you can test tenant settings. You can, you can be the owner of your own tenant. Because sometimes you are working in a company where you are not a Power BI admin and you need to test something. And for that, you just need to follow this link, you create the developer subscription, you get the licenses, the only detail that you need to care about is this is just for development purposes. And they will track you down. So don't think that you can just use and, uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, for example, you own a company, a small company, and then create a developer subscription. You go there and you, you use it for, for email and you use it for, for your Power BI uh, reports, whatever. This will, they will track you down and they, they won't renew the subscription. So every 90 days, um, they will do some telemetry analysis. And if they detect that you use it for development purposes, and why they detect that? For example, if you use it for production purposes, you are going to see the same report or the same user is going to see the same report every day. 
It's, that's not normal. That, this is not development. Uh, but this is insanely useful, okay? Because you, you can test whatever you want. You are the owner. You, you don't need to ask permissions for anyone. You can, you can test what, what uh, types of configurations. You can, you can test the APIs as an admin, because probably most of you don't have admin rights in your own tenant, if you are a Power BI developer, right? So look at it. It's, it's, I highly recommend you to, to, to set that up. Another one. Another one that's very, very simple. It exists since the beginning. It's using template files. And template is, is, is basically an accelerator of a development. And one more time, if you work in a team, you can have your own template. Because not everyone can design pretty reports, for example. I don't have any, any I'm, not, I'm not by any means good designing a good, beautiful report. But if I have a template that I start whenever I'm going to do a, a new Power BI development, I can have all the theme, I can have the, 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 um, the mock-up of the report, and then I will just bring the new data and swap with the new measures, and I will have a pretty report. This can make you a lot, lot more efficient. And in that template, you can have a theme, you can have standard calculation groups or generic calculation groups, you can have the calendar and the timetable, and you can start, every time you start a new development on the team, start with a template. Uh, I have on my... On my, uh, on my GitHub, on this link, a sample of one of these Power BI templates. And what I like to do on this template is, is basically, it's a star schema. This is also useful. Whenever I get a question from a customer, I always I take this template, I, I, I try to replicate what the problem of the customer, and then I can bring, give that back to the customer for him to, 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 to figure that out, because the data in here is dummy data. And by the way, uh, uh, a tip that, uh, that I can give you is on the Power Query, this, this Power BI template, you can refresh it because it's not connected anywhere. All the data is embedded inside the file. So it's in here. I have like, encoded uh, all the data in, inside the Power Query, and then I created my star scheme. Of course, that this data, whenever you are building your, if you are building something for, for a customer, you will delete these tables. These are dummy tables. But if you just want to test something really quick, this is refreshable, and you can share it. You don't have any, any, any privacy issues in here. And you can uh, have a, a beautiful report that you can, whenever you bring the new data, let's imagine that this, this was a new table that I just um, used. I can just drag the field, and all the configuration of the visual will be there. Okay. And of course, I have the calendar table already embedded in here using Power Query to generate the calendar table. I could be using DAX to generate the calendar table if I want. But it's, it's, it's a productivity. Uh, it, it's, a, it's also something inside the team that can really, really boost your, your productivity. So consider it, and, uh, and uh, you will see that, that it's, it's well worth it. OK. Now. Calculation groups. Let's talk a little bit about calculation groups. And in and, and calculation groups, most of the examples that you find online, they are always about time aggregations, time variations. But this is way, way more powerful than that. Okay? I will give you three examples of what you can do with calculation groups that can also make you more productive. I'm very lazy, by the way. <laughs> I'm always trying to find things to, 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 to be more efficient than what I do. Uh, and uh, my favorite one is the, the one at the top. That is, so that is a common best practice in BI. Whenever you show a number, show a comparison. Because I can look there and I can see uh, five mi uh, 15 million sales. This can be good and can be very, very bad. To know, I need to have a comparison. And to build that, exactly that, 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 uh, that, uh, uh, that visual, you, you, can, you can use a custom visual. There are custom visuals to do it. There is a KPI visual out of the box that you can get close. Uh, or you can use multiple cards, and you can use multiple visuals, and then you will have a, a, problem, a performance problem, because you should reduce the amount of visuals to as much as possible inside the report page. And you can use calculation groups. Let me show you. This is really annoying me, the, the mouse. Um, let me show you how you can use calculation groups to get to here. So I have my card, and then I have a calculation group that I called smart calcs. 
And the smart calcs is just a calculation group with a calculation item, with a, a collection of calculation items that I can apply. So this is a standard card. So this is not a uh, custom visual. It's a standard card visualization. So what I need to do is I drag the smart calc to the visual, to the filters on this visual, and then I will filter the label calendar last year, uh, delta last year. And now this has just been transformed into the, the value of the, of, the, of the measure and the variation comparison to, to last year. How did I do this? Really simple. Let's go to Tableau Editor. To, to, to create and manage and, and uh, develop calculation groups, you need to use Tableau Editor. And let's see what the smart call is all about. So this is, this is the code I need to do. So what I'm doing is I'm getting the selected measure. I'm calculating the selected measure the same period last year. And then I'm just returning a text of the measure, formatting with the format of the measure, and calculated the growth, and then pl also put that in the text. So I'm transforming the value. Of course, that this will only work in visuals that show te text. This won't work in a, in, a, in, a, in a line chart, for example. But look, I just made it possible to very easily and very efficiently have that variation with low effort, because this is generic. This will work with whatever measure, with whatever visual that shows text. It also works with the table. So this can be very, very efficient. Another one that I like is the randomize. So I'm showing uh, uh, just for you to see the power of calculation groups, because a calculation group can change on the entire page every value of every measure. So I have a calculation uh, item that's called randomize. And what this does is basically multiply the selected measure by a run. So I'm doing a demo. I don't want to show the actual values, so I can drag the smart cult, in this case, to the filter on this page. And if I apply this, this will change all the values in the visuals. This can be useful to just, OK, I'm showing this to someone that I don't want to show the real data. I can apply this really quickly, and I can show my dashboard. Okay. So calculation groups, the takeaway here is, is much, much more than time intelligence. You can do a lot of smart stuff with it. How much time do I have? 18 minutes, OK. I usually try to rush. I really don't want <laughs> to run, run, run out of time. Uh, but I think I'm, I'm OK. OK, this is one of my favorite techniques. This is a power query technique. I call it the file proxy. I, I, I'm talking about this for the last two years. Sometimes I show it. Sometimes I don't show it in, the, in, the, in my sessions. But it's, it's one of my favorite techniques. And the idea is this. So when you are working in Power Query and you are connecting to files, and the files can be in a file system, it can be in SharePoint, it can be in, on a data lake, so, but you are reading files, you have two options. And imagine that you, you, are, you are reading files from a file system and you are going to read file, a file for sales and a file for products and a file for um, customers. You, can, you will need to create three queries in Power BI Desktop. You can create on each query, you can do the folder, file, select the file, open the file, and do the transformations. And then if later you want to change the location of the files from file system to a data lake, you need to change those three queries. This is not efficient. What you can do is you can have a query in the middle that I call the file proxy. And the query in the middle, it will it will connect to the, a, a query called files from folder. And then all the other queries, the, the, the final queries that will going to get loaded to Power BI, to the Power BI data set, they will connect always to the file proxy in the middle. And why? Because if later I want to change the location, I only need to change one query. Because all of them, they all connect to the same file proxy to get the files. Let me try to show you. And I will show you with a real example. I'm, I'm working on a, on a gateway monitoring solution. And in this gateway monitoring solution, uh, what it is? OK. Let me show you. So on this gateway monitoring solution, it will be an architecture that it's a, a collection of PowerShell scripts that will get the gateway logs. It will send the data to a, to a blob storage, to a data lake. But 
I'm developing right now. I don't want to be connecting to the data lake because I need to be connected to the internet and it will be slower connecting to a data lake than connecting to the file system. So I also have the files with the same folder structure that will exist on the, on the data lake locally. So gateway ID, logs folder, and for each day, a, con a collection of files. Okay, this is that, these are the, the gateway files. So, and then what I can do is, so I, I have three queries in here, the gateway logs, the query execution reports, and the gateways information. And I could, for example, connect on the gateway logs, on the source, connect directly to the folder. But one more time, it's three queries. If later I wanted to change the location from a file system to the data lake, I need to change three queries. Now imagine this if it, if it was 20. You need to change, you will spend like a couple of hours doing that. So what you can do is, is this. So I have, I created the files from disk. And the files from disk knows, it's a query, it's an intermediate query, it's not loaded to the model, it's disabled the load, but it's a query that knows how to read the folder, okay? And I create the exact same thing, files from storage. And this is a query that knows how to read from a data lake. But in the end, in the end, all of these queries, they all have a content column and they all have a folder path. On the data lake, the folder path is the path to the data lake. And on the file system, the folder path is the path, is the path to the folder. But it's a file. It's always a file. It's not different. So I have each one of these. So, and if, if I have also a files from SharePoint, I will do the same thing, files from SharePoint. Now the trick is, I create another query that is also hidden, called files, and in this one, I'm selecting from where I want to read. If I want to read from disk, or if I want to read from blob storage. At the development stage, I'm reading from the disk, because I'm developing, I want to be fast, I don't want to wait. So now I'm going to switch to the blob storage, so I comment this, but it's a single operation. I don't need to do that on the other queries, and now, all the other queries, the final queries, they, what they do is they connect to files and then they filter the files that they want. So in this case, I want the content type logs. Okay? On the other one, the query execution report, I want the content type reports. And this is not downloading the files, so you don't, you don't get a performance issue because the, 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 the step that will download the files, it will be this one in here that where it will be this step in here where I'm actually reading the CSV document. Up until this point, I'm not reading any data. So you can have a single query with all the files. Up to this point, no data is read from the file. Okay? So and this can also be, uh, and, and it is, in my opinion, a very efficient way whenever you want it in a doubt that the location of the files will change. Okay? Of course, if you know, okay, the file won't change, this will be always in the file system, it will be always in, in, in a SharePoint or in a data lake, go for it. Go, don't do this. But, but even if, if, if you are working with a data lake, you can do this to be more efficient because working with a local file system, it's always more efficient than working with a data lake. Okay? You, don't you don't have the network lat latency to download the files. Okay, let's move forward. Another tip, XMLA endpoints. Um, it's the first time I'm doing this demo, I hope it works. It requires premium, so you need premium to do it. And uh, XMLA endpoint, it is something that exists, exists for a long time since analysis services. And it's basically an endpoint that you can use to deploy your model. So you, that, that's what the endpoint that Tableau Editor does to deploy your data sets. But it can also be used to completely completely control the data set. You can change the data set and then take, use the XMLA endpoint with the TOM library to change the data set online if you want and deploy a new version if you want. So I'm going to show you, um, and it's also the, the XMLA endpoint that allows you to do end-to-end -end CICD approach if you want, continuous integration and deployment. I will show you an example of something that I got asked recently from a customer, I, and, I, and I did this POC just to prove that, that concept. It's, it's a script that will go to a workspace, that it's an original workspace. So I, de I, I deploy the data set to uh, workspace zero. And then the script goes to workspace zero, 
and it will read the data set that exists in workspace zero. So that's the first step over there, the get bim. And it will replicate that data set in one 100 workspaces if I want. And on each replication, it will change the data set. It will change the partition. It will, for example, change the sales to only include the sales for a, a specific uh, state. Okay. I want to. I, I have one workspace with all the data, and now I want to replicate that data set automatically. So no man in the middle. I want to replicate with a workspace for each state, filtering the data on each state and refreshing the data set. And you will see that you can build this using the Tom library in the XMLA endpoint in a very very easy way. I know if you are not into code, this might scare a little bit. But uh, one more time, focus on the possibilities, not the how. The, all the code is, is online. So let me go to my PBI script repo. Uh, I think I got it open already, but I don't know what's happening. OK, here's a script called replicate. And I also want to open another one, as.helper. OK, so the script has three parameters. So what's the source uh, workspace? So the, the, the endpoint where the data set, the original data set exists, and then a, an array of all the target workspaces where I want to deploy the data set, and the database, the data set name. And you can see this is 100 lines of code. It's not, not something, it's not very complex. Uh, I'm also using in, in, an intermediate module that is also on my GitHub called AS Tabular Helper. This is basically a wrapper for the Tom library, the Tabular Object Model library. So, for example, the get AS database, if you search it here, it will. Oh, it's not searching. Okay. It will. It's a, it's a commandlet that where I specify the, the server name, I'm connecting to the server name, and I'm downloading the BIM file of, uh, of the data set. And for each workspace, I'm just doing the deployment. And this is hard-coded, of course. This should be a configuration. But for the sake of simplicity, I'm, uh, for if the workspace ends in one, I'm applying these filters. If it ends in two, I'm applying these filters. If it ends in three, I will apply these filters. And I'm changing the M code of the partition of the table cells. So I'm changing the M code and I'm, and I'm applying the filter on directly on the, on, the, on the SQL statement. And I update the file locally, the BIM file, and I deploy the database and I refresh the data set. Okay? Just these three calls. If I run it, I know this will ask for my authentication. Okay, again. Approved. It's done. And this will deploy the data set. Again. Of course, I'm, I'm, I'm doing the authentication because I don't want to put my credentials on the script. But you could put your credentials, which is not safe, or you could use a service principle, and, uh, and which is safer than using your, your credentials. But you can have this in an unattended operation. So you don't need to have that prompt asking for the, for the credentials. So in this. Basically, we'll deploy that data set to those three workspaces completely automatic for me. And if I go to the data set one, and on data set one, I'm filtering on Texas and Pennsylvania, create from scratch, uh, geography, state, and sales. This just has data from Texas and Pennsylvania. So you can see, and the takeaway here is, first, the XMLA endpoint allows you to automate stuff, but it also allows you to deploy and use in the Tom library, you can change the BIM file. And you can easily make changes and deploy with those changes. If you want to get crazy, you can even generate the whole data set using the Tom library if you want. Okay? You, don't need, you, you can generate data sets. It's a huge advantage. And, uh, and, uh, and, and can also make you, make you way more productive. Last demo. Uh, how much time do I have? Five minutes. Five minutes. OK. So uh, 
This is my favorite demo, by the way. <laughs> there are, first of all, there are REST APIs. So if you, and if you also want to boost your productivity, know about these REST APIs. Not only this one that I'm about to show you, but there are many. You can use REST APIs to create workspaces automatically. You can use REST APIs to rewind reports from a, 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 you can change the data set of a report doing a rewind operation and avoid doing it manually. You can do, you can do monitoring, so you can get activity logs and, the, and, and what exists in your tenant as an admin. You, can, you have admin, operation, uh, admin REST APIs. You have a ton of REST APIs that you need to know about. Okay? And sometimes you are doing a manual operation that can be automated with a, with a REST API. And this one, the, the REST API execute queries, it's an API that got released, I think, late last year, and is amazing. <laughs> what you can do with this, when I heard the first time about this, my, my head was bubbling with ideas. Okay? You can do all sorts of useful stuff with this. You can do uh, data integration tests. You can deploy a data set and have a notebook doing connecting to that data set using the REST API. You don't need to use uh, uh, an XLM, XMLA endpoint. You don't need to use a C Sharp library to connect to the data set. It's a REST API. Whatever can call a REST API, you can, you, can, uh, you, can, you, you can use it. So you can do data validation tests. You can do data quality. You can extract data from a data set, but be, be warned, a data set is not a database to extract data. A Power BI data set is it's not really a database to extract data. If you do it, you'll, you'll, be, you'll be in trouble. But sometimes, for example, you have a data set, you have a logic of the, of the, of the KPIs, and you want to extract for example, a KPI for the, uh, the, the value for the month, that it will be a small amount of data. That's good. To do a snapshot. Do, you want to do a monthly snapshot of your main KPIs in your, inside your company. You want to store that snapshot in the database or store that snapshot in the a, in a, in a data lake for auditing purposes. That is good. Now, one thing that is not good is you have a one million, uh, have a few mil, uh, a billion uh, table, uh, database, and you want to use the REST APIs to extract that data just because you want. That that's not good. If you want to extract billions of rows or millions of rows, go to the database. It's don't use Power BI for that. It will end up badly for sure. A and the API has some limitations. It can only extract 100k rows, for example. You can, and I will show you this. You can build an alerting system. You have KPIs, you have sales, you have a comparison of sales versus last year by employee, and you want to know, you want to generate an alert to the, to the managers saying which employees are underperforming, for example, or which products are underperforming. You, there are functionality out of the box to do that, but in here you can, you can plug and play, for example, Power Automate, connecting to the REST API, getting those employees or products, and then generating a notification to the managers with an Excel file attached. And this works on premium, and it works on pro. So it's, you, it's, you can have a website that you are pub using published web uh, to, to show a report, and you can use the REST API to get the number that will show on, uh, on the website in a more uh, contextual way data from the data set without having to replicate and go, go to the same database of your data set. And you can plot that data. So, Many, many ideas that you <laughs> of things that you can do with this. I really like. I, I will show you just a, a demo of that alerting system. So I have this Power Automate over here. And the Power Automate is running every day. It's a, it's a flow that is running. Every day it runs at 9 AM. And it has a DAX query. And this DAX query is basically for each employee is comparing the sales of today versus the sales of the same day of the previous year. And I'm calling the REST, the REST API. So I'm calling the, the API is basically API power BI.com, data sets, the data set ID slash execute queries with this payload. The queries you put the DAX query in here. You need to use a service principle. So this you need to create a service principle for that. Uh, I'm not going to show you how to do it. I don't have the time, but you can find online uh, very easily. And then I'm just sending an email to the manager. I'm creating with a text, with a, with a, I'm creating a, an Excel file with that data, the data that comes from the, from the Power BI data set, and saying, OK, these are the underperforming employees. Uh, do something about it if you want. So let's, let me run this manually. But this is running every day. 
and I should, I hope, receive an email. Here it is, with the underperforming employees and the Excel attached uh, that I can that I can use. Okay, I just created a very simplistic alerting mechanism using the REST API and using the the um, Power Automate. And I always say this, I, I really find this beautiful, the, the way of this Microsoft ecosystem where you can, you have Power BI, you have Power Automate, and you can bring them together and you can build stuff like this without writing a single line of code uh, that are really, really powerful. Okay? Because you can be very, very dynamic. I can do all sorts of other stuff in here. I can write on the text whatever I want. I can do another query to another data set and plug it together. I can, I can create like a scorecard in an email if I want. Okay. This was my last demo. I'm happy. I just end up in time. This never happens to me. It's o'clock. Uh, don't forget the feedback form, uh, please. Um, and um, and thank you. It was a pleasure. <laughs>